For centuries, humans have been growing alongside our botanical brethren. Our histories have mixed and mingled to bring us modern medical marvels, faded folklore, and everything in between. Of course, in order to understand the plant, we have to start with its roots. I'm M. Governor Gaddis, and this is Rooted. Roses are characterized as primarily deciduous woody perennials, but they can be grown in shrub, climbing, or even trailing forms depending on the variety. Most of them do have sharp thorns growing on their stems, and many produce a fruit known as rose hips that are kind of similar to an apple. They're most famous for their large, vibrant, and fragrant flowers with layers and layers of delicate petals. Roses are a member of the Rosaceae family, which also contains fruit like apples, apricots, strawberries, and raspberries. You can easily spot the members of this family because their flowers grow petals in groups of five. Like most of the members of its family, their seeds do contain trace amounts of cyanide, but not enough to be considered dangerous for humans. The earliest recorded remains we know of roses were found in Florissant, Colorado. But we know we've been cultivating roses since at least 500 BC in China, Persia, and other Mediterranean countries. There are hundreds of different rose species, and of the thousands of different cultivars, the vast majority of the garden roses most of us are used to originate from Chinese tea roses, which are prized for their vibrant brooms and stronger fragrance. In China, they symbolize early spring and longevity, and are often used in foods and medicines as they have been for centuries. While tea roses may have taken a while to take off, roses themselves have had no issues finding their way into folklore and gardens across many different cultures, including the Mediterranean. Ancient Greeks and Romans had quite a few stories involving roses. The first is all about exactly how roses came to be. According to legend, one morning the goddess of flowers went for a walk in the early morning. As she was enjoying her stroll, she stumbled upon the body of her favorite nymph. Distraught, she decided to breathe back life into the innocent creature, making it into the most beautiful flower. She phoned a few friends for help. Namely, she called on Apollo, god of the arts, for the breath of life. Bacchus gave the nymph nectar. Vertumnus gave her fragrance. And Flora herself finally gave the petals, creating what we now know as the rose. Another story about roses in Greek mythology comes to us in the form of the origin of white roses, which were brought to earth anywhere Aphrodite's sea foam touched the earth. To understand this one, though, we're going to have to really dive deep into some family history. Oranus, father of the sky, just hated his son Kronos. This is because he was a titan, which honestly seems a little unfair, but whatever, I guess. Basically, he hated his son so much that he imprisoned him in Earth. This rightfully made Kronos pretty angry, because what the fuck, Dad? So one day Ornus comes home to see his wife Gaia, mother of Earth, who is also low-key a little pissed that he trapped their son. So she arms Kronos with a sickle, and he cuts off his father's testicles. Once those bad boys plopped into the ocean, Aphrodite was born, and now anywhere her sea foam touches the earth, white roses appear. Aphrodite actually has a lot to do with roses, which is why the flower has such close ties to her. In fact, the word rose is actually said to stem from her son's name, Eros. Eros also loved roses. So much so that every morning he would go out and give his roses a big ol' sniff. One morning, on his sniffing tour of the garden, he ended up sniffing a bee, who was honestly not a fan. The bee stung him, and in his anger, he fled to Aphrodite, who suggested he take his arrows and go out to shoot the bee. Bees are obviously quite small and nimble, so arrows struggled to make his mark. 
leaving his roses absolutely covered in arrows, which is how they got their thorns. In another story, Aphrodite's mortal lover, Adonis, was attacked by a wild boar. In an effort to save him, she rushes over to him, dripping in sea foam and cutting her ankles on the rose's thorns, staining them with her blood, and leaving them a deep crimson forever. It comes then as no surprise that roses are associated with love. But did you know they also symbolize secrecy? Apparently, Cupid brought Hippocrates, the god of silence, roses in exchange for keeping Venus's indiscretions on the down low. But what were the indiscretions, you ask? Well, Venus got extremely jealous of Psyche, as people were beginning to call her the second coming of Venus, as she was so beautiful and so lovely. I will say that calling someone the second coming of a person who was still very much alive is pretty rude. But upon hearing these comments, Venus is like, what am I, the Crypt Keeper? And then proceeds to misdirect her anger at Psyche, literally torturing her to a point where she loses her ability to speak. She sends Cupid to go and kill her, but Cupid falls in love with Psyche and ends up marrying her after gaslighting everyone into thinking that this was all just one big misunderstanding by giving the god of silence roses. This is actually believed to be where the term sub rosa, or under the roses, comes from, and is why you might notice ceilings in restaurants, meeting places, and even confessionals are adorned with carvings or paintings of roses. They're meant to serve as a reminder that whatever is said in the space is to remain confidential. With all of these stories, it comes as no surprise that roses have come to be so steeped in symbolism. Just like last week, our Victorian friends loved to send different messages with roses. Let's jump into some quick decoding, just in time for Valentine's Day. Red roses are said to symbolize deep love or desire, and a single red rose is meant to be an early expression of deep love. White roses are meant to symbolize devotion, purity, and charm, while red and white roses together symbolize unity. Pink roses are meant to represent happiness, dark pink thankfulness, light pink grace, burgundy roses are for beauty, dark crimson are meant to be for mourning, orange symbolizes fascination, peach is meant to symbolize immortality or modesty depending on who you ask, yellow is for friendship, joy, and gladness, Lavender for enchantment. Tea roses are meant to represent remembrance. Single roses for undying love. Thornless roses for love at first sight. Rosebuds represent beauty and youth, while mature blooms are meant to symbolize gratefulness or emphasize a specific point that the gifter is making, while a rose leaf means you may hope, and dried white roses mean Death is preferable to a loss of virtue. In this case, I think the most brutal rose combination to send someone is a single dried white rose with leaves, which would mean, you might hope I could love you, but I would rather die. Speaking of burns, roses have been used for centuries to help heal skin and cure other ailments. Rose petals were often juiced, and used as an early antiseptic rinse to help with sores in the mouth or on gums, and even to help with thrush. Whole flowers were mixed with wine and prescribed to soothe stomach aches, and often baths with roses or rose oil would be prescribed to soothe inflammation, ulcers, and other ailments. In less pleasant-sounding medical treatments, rose oil was mixed with butter, brought to a liquidy smooth consistency, and then injected into the anus to cure dysentery. As if the stakes and organ trail weren't high enough already. But what exactly makes roses effective in antiseptic and anti-inflammatory uses? Well, we still don't have exact answers, but we do know that they contain anthocyanins, flavonoids, and polyphenols which all help to reduce inflammation 
and act as antioxidants and antimicrobials. While we're still digging into the science behind why roses are so effective, herbalists and spellcrafters alike have been using roses to aid in their healing practices for ages. In spells, roses are often used to bring love, positivity, and cleansing energy. They can be dried, burned, soaked, steeped, or spritzed, depending on the kind of spell and intention they're being used for. While roses are a popular addition to many spells, they're also a favorite for bringing a dose of floral freshness to foods and drinks. Today, roses play a vital role in our gardens, our skincare, and even in our medicine. Roses are currently being studied in treatment for both HIV and antibiotic-resistant strains of staph. It's also extraordinarily popular in skincare, where it helps to clear blemishes, brighten skin, and reduce the appearance of wrinkles. Its scent is popular for both its freshness and its soothing properties. Of course, Roses are probably most famous for being the traditional gift on Valentine's Day. So, if you're listening to this when it comes out, I'm sure you've seen a bunch of them recently. If you want to learn more about Valentine's Day and how roses came to be such a big part of it, check out the bonus episode. If you liked the show, Please consider subscribing and leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Rooted.Pod. We're on YouTube at Rooted.Podcast, and check out our website, RootedPod.com, for transcripts, updates, and so much more. Thanks for being here, and until next time, be kind to yourselves, be kind to the earth, and just like a plant, drink your water. 